Am I visible? I think I am. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Cool. Well, um, just have a look here. I think it's all good. Um, I guess we can get get started. Um, welcome to this. No, no, go back, go back, go back. One slide. Awesome. <laughs> welcome to this thinking serverless to the next level talk. Um, and welcome to this one. It's a stream talk. I was supposed to be today in, in South Africa, but yeah, we have to do this now via, via webcam and, uh, and, and stream. So we're going to be talking today about serverless. We're going to be talking how can we actually move our serverless setup to the next level. Um, now, what that means, I'll get that into a, in a bit. So who am I and why should you care? Right? My name is Darko Mesaroš. I'm a senior technical uh, evangelist or developer advocate, as we call us, ourselves right now, from AWS. Uh, I cover mostly Central East in Europe and Russia, but um, I, I, I am based in Berlin right now, uh, but I, I fly under many colors and many flags. I originally come from, from Serbia, but one fun fact about me, I have actually changed five countries in the last eight years. So, you know, from Serbia to Czech Republic, to Malta, to Ireland, and now to Germany. Yeah, uh, it's been it's been a wild ride. <laughs> so I've been working for AWS for the last, uh, let's say, uh, four years, a bit more, right? So started in premium support, moving up from premium support to solution architecture, and now I get to talk to you as a developer advocate. So fun times. Now, let's let's ask ourselves first: What is serverless? Um, I would love to see your hands showing that how many people know serverless, but in general, serverless is not a thing where there are no servers. Oh, there absolutely are servers. Uh, you know, it's not something magical that <laughs> runs in some black box of the cloud. It is actually, when we talk about serverless, it's an operational model, more, more than a compute platform, right? There are no servers to manage. They exist, but you don't have to manage them. Uh, it has automatic scaling, so it is actually built as such to have automatic automatic scaling uh, included, right? And with all of the automatic scaling and the way it's designed and built, you get this uh, highly available and secure way of functioning it. You know, by design, it should be highly available. And one of the biggest things about serverless is you actually pay for value. So you, so you literally pay for every execution. So if you have a Lambda script, which is kind of the core of, of serverless computing, if you have a Lambda script on AWS, you only pay for its execution and nothing else. So you can kind of technically get to maybe, you know, how much does a certain API call or a certain uh, customer request cost me in cents. So you only pay for exactly what you what, what your value is. Uh, so I, I'm coming from an assumption that you know how to build a serverless function. You know how to get started, right? You know, you have done your first uh, workshop, you saw, saw those many GitHub um, uh, workshops available out there. Maybe somebody showed you, you have a simple Hello World uh, application running, or maybe you even have something in production. But now what? So what do we do now? How do we take this actually to the next level? Well, it's a six-step process, right? <laughs> actually, I'm going to be talking about six kind of independent things around here. It's not going to be purely technical. There are some non-technical elements to my talk as well. So I hope everybody gets a chance to enjoy. Uh, first of all, infrastructure as code. I mentioned this first because it's very important. If you're not using infrastructure as code, take a note and get started in using infrastructure as code because it will help you down the line. What is infrastructure as code? Well, it's, well, it's defining your infrastructure, all of your compute, storage, database, uh, software as a service, any kind of a resource you might have on the cloud, defining it as a piece of code. So instead of going to the web console and clickety-click a whole bunch of times, you open up your uh, text editor, your favorite text editor, you write, write a little template, uh, you submit it through, well, any 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 sort of infrastructure as code service or framework, and well, bam, you have infrastructure running just through that. Now, why is this why is this important? Well, first first of all, it actually makes infrastructure changes very repeatable and predictable. So you actually know what's going to happen when you enter a little piece of code inside of your template. You actually know what you're going to provision, and it's also repeatable. How long does it take to copy, manually copy, a production environment to a test environment? 
right? If you're going to do all those clicks again, it's, it's going to take you a while. Uh, so instead of doing that, you just have a template, uh, make some changes, you know, modify it so it will be a, a developer-friendly or a developer environment-friendly template, and submit, and voila, you have it in a couple of seconds, couple of minutes, you're done, right? And when you want to release infrastructure changes, basically any, any, and you basically keep treating your infrastructure because it's the modern world of the cloud, you treat everything in your infrastructure as an application. So use all the best practices, you use uh, you know, all the tooling such as pipelines, you can use some testing utilities out there that can help you in doing this thing. So instead of actually manually provisioning that template, you can have a CI CD pipeline where you do a Git push, you have a new, new version of your environment, new, uh, of your infrastructure, and, it's, and it goes into production with all tests and bells and whistles, right? And, and finally, again, what I mentioned before, it's very easy to replicate staging, test, and develop environments from production because you can kind of just uh, uh, quickly modify them or, or apply different sets of parameters uh, to do that. Now, I'm going to mention some tools. Of course, uh, coming along, there's a, there's a whole plethora of tools, and I think any tool you use is good, but we'll get to that. But when it comes to tooling, and when it comes to, comes to um, how we do infrastructure code, people ask me a lot. So I, I, I wrote myself a Bash script or a Python script or a Bash or a PowerShell, whatever you would like, right? I wrote, wrote myself a script, and that script provisions myself servers. It's good enough for me. That's something we call imperative language, right? So you basically have to take your script, say, hey, can you please launch me an EC2 instance? You, you made an API call to AWS, launch EC2 instance. And it does that for you, which is okay, but with a couple of caveats. If you run that script 10 times, it will do that 10 times for you. And you have to actually tell it how to exactly launch an instance, what exact sets of commands it needs to do to create that instance. Most infrastructure code uh, uh, frameworks and, and tools actually use something called declarative language. It's basically you tell the, the software, hey, this is what I need. I need uh, an instance with this much memory. I need this instance with this much this configuration. I need a database. I need that. And then the language, the framework itself, takes care of the rest, right? So it goes in the back end and it and it and it just does all the API calls it needs to do. And if you run it 10 times, if there are no changes, it will not keep adding new things because it knows that you have declared something that it already exists and you do not need to repeat it, right? There, well, actually, no changes happen. Uh, but again, uh, some best practice when it comes to IAC or infrastructure as code, you can keep your infrastructure and application in the same repo. And this goes especially when we talk about serverless applications, and you'll, you'll see this later on, where you keep your application and business logic and your infrastructure definitions within the same Git repo, right? Uh, and also when you make some deployments, when you make a deployment to your application, you can potentially make changes to infrastructure. And this will become very much apparent when we uh, when we start talking about serverless and how you actually operate with serverless, that not everything is a, is a virtual machine and not everything is that you can use. Basically, some elements of your business application are actually infrastructure elements, such as uh, software as a service, etc. Uh, for example, right, a uh, couple of you know examples of ISC is AWS CloudFormation, which is well our our own tool for that, and HashiCorp Terraform. Now. There's a lot of different things, right? There's also uh, Pulumi, I believe, and there's um, you can do view Ansible, you can use even potentially Chef and Puppet for these kind of things. All of them has pros and cons. Uh, but again, I will not say which one is better. It's up to you. Uh, but make sure to use one of them. Now, when we talk about serverless applications, there's a, there's a couple of, of frameworks um, people tend to use often these days. Um, one of those is uh, serverless, right? The serverless framework. It's a it's a it's a serverless open source framework that helps you in launching applications, right? Uh, serverless applications, and there's SAM or AWS Serverless Application Model, which is basically our own built um, ISC templating thing for serverless. What these pieces of software or what these tools and frameworks do, they're specifically built to launch serverless application. So they have a certain set of abstractions to help you do this. While well, you can do all of this within Terraform or CloudFormation, it takes some additional effort or let's say additional modeling that you need to do within those templates to kind of create things such as lambdas and DynamoDBs uh, uh, tables and uh, S3 buckets, right? Uh, 
And Serverless and SAM kind of abstract a lot of those things for you uh, and help you do that. For example, uh, SAM is actually based off of CloudFormation. So if you look at SAM, the template looks very much similar to CloudFormation. It actually is CloudFormation, but we are using a transform called Serverless, which you know gives you the ability to create a serverless function uh, and and like a, a simple table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So with this piece of code that you see on screen right now, we have actually created a Lambda function, IAM role, an API gateway, and a DynamoDB table. Right. So uh, looky here, I created a table. Uh, I created a Lambda function. Right. I have I have um, well, yes. I have, uh, I have a, a created an IAM role that allows my serverless function right here to read from a data, database or a, from a dy dy DynamoDB table. I have created an API gateway by defining it right there. How do you actually get those resources? And at the end of the day, I have defined a DynamoDB table as such, right? How do you get started with this? A couple of commands, right? Pip install. You run pip install to install AWS uh, C, uh, uh, SAM CLI. Salmon it, initialize a directory where you want to uh, create your application, serverless applications. Uh, you can run SAM local. This is really great because you can um, kind of test serverless functions such as lambdas and uh, make events and, and do local testing on lambdas. It kind of it kind of runs a lot of the things in Docker on your local laptop, so you don't have to worry about doing uh, pulling things to the cloud and from the cloud to do some testing. And again, you can do some builds and testing and deploys. This is kind of how, it, how, how, how the workflow looks when it comes to SAM. You know, you, you validate, build, package, and deploy, and just rinse and repeat, right? So, um, and for this entire rinse and, rinse and repeat thing, I would highly advise that you use some things such as a code pipeline or Jenkins, Basically, these things allow you to deploy SAM applications. Uh, uh, Code Pipeline has it natively built in through CloudFormation, uh, um, Cloud CloudFormation integration, and Jenkins has a SAM CLI plugin, which kind of allows you to do all of these things from those orchestration tools. It's it's pretty pretty important, right? <laughs> Finally, SAM logs. Um, this allows you to actually get the logs or tail the logs from your serverless application directly on your laptop. So, uh, you know, pretty cool, pretty good for troubleshooting. And finally, Sam Publish, because we have this thing called uh, Serverless Application Repository, which is just a location where you can store your serverless applications. You can just use Sam Publish and it will automatically publish those applications there. Your application, the current application will publish it there. Um, one more piece of tool uh, we have developed, and I actually remember when CDK kicked off, I remember that email, somebody saying, hey, guys, I have an idea. So Cloud Development Kit is not serverless, it's not dedicated for serverless per se, but a lot of people use it as such. Uh, CDK Cloud Development Kit allows you to use uh, infrastructure as code with a generic programming language, right? So you can basically, in this case, you see that I've used TypeScript, but you can use any of the following languages uh, and more are coming. And this is open source. So if you want to implement something for, I don't know, Rust or Haskell, go at it, right? But it's a kind of a similar approach, but it's not serverless specific. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a node module. So, you know, install it with NPM. You can initialize an application. Synth, deploy, diff, and destroy. These are kind of the mostly used commands. But in general, what happens with CDK, you write your infrastructure using a generic programming language, just TypeScript, JavaScript, and all of those things there listed. And what it does, it actually generates, when you run the synth command, it generates a CloudFormation template. It kind of gets a very complex CloudFormation template, but it does that for you. Uh, but you can use all the all the bells and whistles of like let's say TypeScript and like reading from this and looping and whatnot, whatnot. Yeah. So it's pretty cool, right? And all of these commands are kind of self explore self explanatory. Deploy, well, deploy. Uh, you actually deploy your stack from your laptop to to the cloud. A diff, you make just see what changes have happened since your last update and destroy. Well, bye bye infrastructure as code, right? Uh, same as before, you can do all of these things through a bunch of pipelines, uh, you know, CD, uh, code pipeline and Jenkins. All of these things exist as either native integrations or uh, uh, some plugins for Jenkins. And, like this is an example, right? So you can see this um, this CDK uh, piece of code actually creates a Lambda script. Right? It creates well, it creates a um, confirmation stack. It creates a Lambda function. It creates a CloudWatch event rule. Uh, and sets the target. 
basically is that, right? It took this much to do this. Super simple, especially if you're already familiar with one of these languages, it helps you greatly um, speed up your infrastructure code thing. Because sometimes if you want to start with PopFormation or some other programming language, which is kind of domain specific, or well, it's YAML or JSON or, uh, or something else, um, it might be a bit complex or you might lack some things, but if you're already used to Python or JavaScript or TypeScript, it might be easier to get, uh, get into this. Myself personally, I use CDK for everything I do. Everything I, I want to create a small project, CDK in it, and just kick it off from there. Now, infrastructure code, let's, we moved on from that, but let's talk about something else. And I mentioned this in, in, in during my uh, infrastructure code uh, discussion, but it's automating deployments. Now this might come for as new for some people, might be something very uh, uh, common knowledge for a lot, but CI CD is a very important part of any application lifecycle even serverless applications, right? So when we talk about CI CD or continuous integration, continuous deployment or continuous delivery, right? There's a, there's a difference. Uh, we kind of separate those phases into like four well, parts, right? Build, well, source where you put your code, build where you actually build, compile, test, unit test your code. Test, this is where you actually deploy to a stingy environment, maybe do something like uh, um, integration tests, right? Service tests, and then finally, you ship the product. In these four stages, when we look at where the CI and where the CD fit, well, CI is just part of the source and build. You commit your code, you build it, you run some unit tests, you get an artifact, which you then deploy autom uh, well manually or automatically or whatever your way to do it, but you get an artifact out of it. The CD part is actually continuous deployment or from source to production automatically, right? So all the builds, all the tests, all the deployments to production should be done automatically with that CD part of CI CD. Um, one thing when we talk about um, deploying code, and especially when we're deploying serverless, uh, and Lambdas, right? Um, code deploy is a service that deploys code, right? Uh, a well named service. So, code deploy actually deploys your code to either EC2 instances, Lambda functions, containers, but when you do code deploy with lambdas, you can actually do something called canary deployments. Um, well, does anybody know where they're, where they're called canary deployments? Uh, actually, there's a story behind it. When uh, in the old days, miners, you know, people who dig big holes, used to um, mine, you know, mine go through a mine shaft, and they would bring a canary, a little bird, a little yellow bird in a cage, and they would bring it along with them. And as long as the bird was singing, it was good. There was no methane in the air. As soon as the bird stopped singing, there's methane in the air and there's some danger and they have to quickly revert back, right? So they have this canary that will tell them there's a problem. So when we come to canary deployments, it's kind of the same thing. You deploy a canary, a version two of your code, but you only deploy it for 10% of your audience, right? Just a small bit, and you wait for 15 minutes or, or a, set amount, a set amount of time. Uh, if there are no alarms, um, no, no, it will not roll back, right? You have an automatic rollback if there's an alarm, if the canary detects methane or your application detects problems, right? So if, if, you, if there's no alarms, you know, you kind of run a post traffic hook, which is basically just switching the live alias. Uh, of your production Lambda script to the new version of a Lambda script and basically reroutes all the new, new invocations to your version two because you're healthy, right? And it, these things can actually be set. When, we, when I talked about SAM, SAM, you can, when you create a function, you can actually set a deployment preference that basically will do a canary. Uh, there's a couple of, couple of, of deployment options uh, uh, pre-built into SAM that you can do this. Like in this case, it's canary 10%, 10 minutes. So pretty, pretty cool, uh, very useful. If you're not using Canary deployment, you should. It will help you from shipping a potentially buggy Lambda into production. All right, we have automated our deployments, but let's now step a moment, let's just step back from the tech, right? You, you've seen a lot of code, you see me speaking a lot of, you know, a mumbo jumbo, but let's step back from the code. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about for something maybe for the non-technical folks in the audience but it's still important. Let's talk about project to product, right? So you're a developer, you're a 
you're, you're an owner of a, of, a, of a piece of software, you know how to develop features in production. But actually, how can you evolve your software, your workload, your, your thing in the right direction, right? It's very important that when we think about um, the things we're building, not as projects, but as products, right? So, and I'll explain why, right? So when we talk about projects, a project actually forces you to think in milestones, right? You have a project and then a version one, version two, version three. You keep in this linear way and you kind of have a set defined path how you develop your project. When I talk about a product, you get this wavy line where you don't really know, uh, or basically your, your path changes as it goes along because it follows your customer's needs, right? And the customer needs can, can you know, go all, all over the place, but you need to keep at it because uh, there's, some, there's a different approach to this, right? And I'll, I'll come back to the next slide. Why is product preferable than a project? Well, project, you reach a milestone, right? But with a product, you look for a customer value, right? So there's no version five or you know a set date we need to release version X, but you're actually looking for customer value, you're looking to release this feature to a customer that will actually bring its value, right? Um, when you talk about milestones, you talk about costs to reach a milestone, right? Which is okay, but with looking at lifecycle costs, it's better. Why is this better? What, what, like, let's say, let's say we're building a car, right? You build a car, you just you don't just keep tacking on things to a car because that thing is new and great, right? Some some things do, but in general, you should not do it. You should think of a life cycle of that car, of a life cycle of what you're building. So looking forward, in a sense that. If I build a car, I want to make sure that there's replaceable parts for the next 10 years that my customers who are using my service or using whatever I produce, my car, are able to keep on using it. That life cycle can keep improving and going on as it goes, right? It's not something that you kind of build then and there and that's it, right? Uh, because you were backward looking and looking at your project milestones and I want to make this, uh, make this point version five because I want it, right? Thinking of lifecycle costs is much more forward-looking and it helps you more, help you helps you um, advance a bit more, right? And 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 when it comes to product development, right? So why do we change a product? Why do you make a change to a product? Once you deploy something, when you create something, why do you make changes to it? Well, I mean, there's a whole lot of different things. Why, right? So you know, from implementing features, right, to fixing defects, uh, you know, doing some risk mitigation, and of course, technical depths, right? And who handles these things? Well, this is kind of how it, how it kind of uh, aligns, right? You know, your debts, your technical debts are actually fixed by developers and architects, right? They keep uh, coming up. Uh, security and compliance works on risks. Your customer reports your defect. If you have a bug, you get a, get a report from a customer. And business uh, influences features. There's a slight problem to this. You should try to do this. You should try to have customers work with your business and help develop features. And I'm not saying you should get reports of what customers think. Talk to customers directly. Try to get direct with the customer as much as possible. Uh, with Amazon, we try to get feedback as soon as we can from directly from customers, from the first lines. If I was there, I would get feedback from you, but you can, you can ask me questions in the chat later on. Um, we take that feedback seriously and bring it to the business, and that's how we decide to build features or not. Right? A case an example, EKS or Elastic Kubernetes Service, people asked us to run Kubernetes for them, asked us, and we did. So that's how you do it. It's not the business make a decision, but customers help the business make decisions. Also, when we talk about products, one of the things we need to keep in mind, because we don't have set milestones, right? We have this dynamic, fluid way of doing it. You need to avoid overutilization. You, uh, what I talk about, what I mean by that, you need to avoid giving exact roles to exact people, right? So, or having a hundred percent utilization of your people. Make sure to have at least twenty to thirty to forty percent, how, how much you need of, let's say, free time or a time available from your team to be able to react to feedback changes or like you know something happening, uh, customer value changes, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, make sure to have this bit of slack in that little roadmap table, uh, roadmap arrow so that your 
your your engineers, your product owners, uh, and anybody who works uh, works uh, with this product uh, can help you grow it. Uh, one of the examples is here. I need to I need to explain this that embracing failure is super important, right? So this is from our 2015 letter to the shareholders. Uh, we think at Amazon that we are very distinctive in failure, right? So uh, with every failure, um, it helps you grow, right? I'll give you two examples. One of them you might recognize, one of them you might not. But way back when, I don't even remember this, we had an auction site. That didn't work, right? Uh, does anybody you, has anybody used Amazon auction? No, right? So, but it, it helps us launch our new online marketplace. But the biggest example is the Fire Phone. How many of you have a Fire Phone? Nobody, right? But it was a massive failure, right? So a lot of million of dollars, we kind of failed, but it helped us actually learn how to make hardware, right? We actually, you know, built Alexas and Echo devices and helped, that experience has helped us bring that all in. Uh, I just want to make a short interjection here. If you want to have a look at the serverless application, like it's called the positive chat. Um, here's a link to it. You can check it out later on. Uh, I, I just want to give you this little architecture, how it looks. You know, there's a bunch of things, uh, authorization, API gateways, lambdas, uh, some ser some um, AI services, blah, 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 tables. How much lines of code does it take to build the application and infrastructure? Well, 460 lines of code. That's all it took back end and front end. It took 460 lines to build that fully fledged serverless application. So yeah, it kind of gets you thinking that you can do things much more simply now, right? And, and, and we talk about serverless product development, uh, looking at this previous statement, less code, right? More speed. You actually get to focus on what you want to build and going to back to one of my first topics, you actually can estimate the cost per user per feature or per request because you only pay for what they request, right? Um, and you can actually link business models to tiers and features and costs because you can understand how much does a certain feature or a function or set of function costs to invoke. You can actually link that thing uh, to, to a, a business model, right? Um, it's much faster to turn an idea into a prototype it would take me, you know, to make a simple serverless application with all the bells and whistles and infrastructure, it would take me maybe seven minutes to do it. It takes much less time to do it, like from scratch, try for a prototype. And if it doesn't work, fine, it's okay. Repeat, rinse and repeat, right? And also, once you have that pro pro prototype, it's much easier to bring it into production because you, you use all of these elements which are production ready services, third party, third -party services, uh, managed services from AWS. It's much more easier to, um, to bring that into prod. And, and last but not least, service updates enable new features. If a new service is released from AWS or some third-party vendor, some managed service that you can use within your serverless application, you can easily enable new features for it. You know, these are kind of a, uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm, I'm talking about when I say managed services, you know, from our AI services such as recognition, translate, and all of those things. Anything we bring into these services can be automatically used into your serverless application with ease. Okay, moving on. Back to technical. Uh, Event-driven microservices. Uh, this, is a, this is a kind of a thing when we talk about microservices, people mention a lot event-driven. And why is event-driven important? Because you make your system more evolvable. Is evolvable a word? I don't know. It helps your system evolve, right? Makes it easy, makes it makes it evolve easier. Um, one thing, I, one quote I need, really need to mention, um, and this really comes into play when we have events. Uh, complexity arises arises when the dependencies among the elements become important. Right? So if you have strict, firm dependencies, uh, you get a lot of complexity, right? And complexity is a science these days, right? So there's a very small, a lot of smart people have written a lot of smart things when you have, um, uh, uh, when it comes to complexity. 
and and people come to you know to me and say you know well sir i want to go back to a more traditional model because running the serverless application with you know hundreds and thousands of 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 of, of microservices or lambda functions can get a bit too complex the amount of services you use is not the complexity but the dependencies between them actually make it complex you know when you have a monolithic application and we have this big old chunk that has all of these you know uh, gears and cogs working with each other in rigid uh, dependency, this is where complexity arises. When you move to services and microservices, you loosen these strong bonds between them and create these kind of, um, how, how would you call them, um, um, decoupled connections that there's not an essentially, essentially a, stir, a, a sturdy connection between two services or two features that if one breaks, everything goes down. Right? So you don't have to think about that as a complexity. You have to make your system uh, event-driven to reduce the complexity, right? And um, one also, this is this is an economic book, economical book. It's not, uh, no, this is not a tech book, right? So this is a basically a, a book on systems and it's a systematics. It's a, it's an old book, but in essence, what does it say? A complex system that that works basically was built from a super simple system, right? So. Uh, you never make a simple, a super complicated system just from the get-go. You don't go and I'm going to write a thousand Lambda scripts today to make my super system complex. No, no, no. Your system needs to evolve. And from a very simple thing, it will grow into something more complex. I'll give you an example. Uh, I guess everybody who uses AWS has used S3 in, at some point. Uh, S3 basically it was built with a certain with a minimal feature set so it could be simple a bunch of busts right so when we built the service back in 2006 it was super simple it had limited uh, set of features but it was robust right so right now basically it well when it was launched it had eight microservices now it has over 200 uh, this is an old slide from last year but you can you can think of that that it's growing even even higher now uh, as, as the as the system goes uh, goes more complex. So how does serverless work? How 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 do you think of your application when you, when you talk about serverless, especially in that whole complexity or event driven system? So you have a fully managed service such as storage, database, analytics, machine learning, anything you would like to you know, first party from AWS or third party from something else. But there's a fully managed service. There's your function. The function is where you actually bring in your business logic, the thing that makes you unique. And all of that is connected through an event. So a user uploads a picture, some data is updated, an API call is made, an event triggers a function, and then function uses those fully managed services to do something, you know, store that picture, uh, um, maybe enter a thing to a database, all those things. So it's kind of an event happens, triggers a function, does something. So yeah. So what is an event? Well, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it's something that happens, right? So uh, events tell us a fact. Events tell us something that has happened and what has happened. And events are an immutable time series. So think of it as an as a immutable time series that you process. You get an event, you do something with it. But it's really, really important, right? So what happens when an event happens, one or more or, or how many different services uh, features parts of your application of your project can react to it right so um but it's a, it's a time series so it happens in that time and multiple things can react to it and do something if it happens again uh multiple other things can react to it and and uh, and, and and do something again it's a, it's a time series kind of immutable um list uh, here's an example a command versus an event right so a command is like hey create a user you literally have to invoke something to create a user. You have to make an API call. You have to invoke an API call to make a, make a user or, or run something directly, trigger something to run a SQL query or, or you know, add a product, create a user. Event is a fact. So a user has been created. A product has been added. So an event is broadcast to multiple services, multiple microservices, multiple parts of their workload and they do something with it, right? So if a user is created, maybe something will create a user profile. Uh, if a product has been added, that product will be added to a specific database or will be uh, put in a specific marketing campaign. So 
you don't have to tell things what to do. You let things know that something has happened and those things actually, well, you work with those things. So a couple of integration patterns we have here uh, for message queues to pub sub messaging and some services that we kind of have that help along these things. Uh, message queues, a typical um, service you would like to use here is SQS, where you kind of decouple uh, your distributed systems. Pub sub messaging is, well, you make a, 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 you, you throw out a message and any subscriber to that message uh, can read it and react to it, again, gets that event. And of course, workflows, when you have a compli complex set of, of tasks or Lambda functions of things you need to do, um, uh, things such as database step function help you actually, you know, kind of uh, wrap your mind around it and create said workflow, uh, all of this. And all of these things are serverless as well. Right? Uh, Let's talk about another book. So this is an economy book, right? So this is that econ economy book is talking about um, anti-fragility, right? So when I talk about anti-fragility, think about our immune system, right? So our immune system constantly gets microinfections. So we constantly keep getting infected by some things. Our system learns from that and then is able to react to a major one, right? So when, when we talk about chaos engineering, so this is the concept of anti-fragility, Chaos engineering is where you introduce micro failures, like small failures uh, at a time and basically help you react to potential big failures in the future, right? So um, just to make sure things work. If you put a small failure, you wanna make sure that your things uh, are, are, are reacting to it properly and reacting to it at scale. Talking at scale, an amazing book by Brendan Gregg. I can, advise it to any person who's interested in performance, but understanding things such as latencies, right? So latency, if one CPU cycle is 0.3 nanoseconds, a memory read takes 120 nanoseconds. But if we scale that thing up to one second of a CPU cycle, memory read is six minutes, right? So you have to understand the scalability of latency and, 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 and you know, it's very important to understand that at, at scale. And when we talk about latency, understand your percentiles. Understand, uh, don't look at, at a, a graph and look at the maximum latency you're receiving. Look at the percentiles, right? Like in this graph, P100 is the maximum latency I have received, right? P99 is basically uh, the, the, the one, basically 99% of, 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 of the latencies are below this, right? P90 and P50 is kind of the median one. So. Look at those things. Look at the, the, the P99s, P90s, and P50s. This will help you understand uh, how latency exactly looks. So your latency is not 24 seconds here. It's most likely one second, right? And this graph is actually from, uh, from uh, AWS, and it's for autoscaling. So it's one of our graphs for uh, autoscaling re requests. Also, one of the important things, uh, when you have a you know, vendor architecture and complex architecture, have end-to-end -end tracing. So services such as X-Ray can help you understand and can help you pinpoint potential problems and failures that can uh, well come up inside of your distributed microservices application. But can we help more? Well, absolutely. So there's a service called Amazon EventBridge. So it's a, it's a serverless event bus, uh, fully managed, all that stuff. It kind of helps you handle these things. So what happens here, you have a bunch of, um, you know, uh, events and and, and you kind of make rules based on those events. So for example, here's an event, you know, a ticket has been created, whatnot, right? And you can create a bunch of example rules. Like for example, if a source is this, or let's say a uh, uh, department is billing or fulfillment or a uh, ticket is resolved, you can do different things, right? Based on these events, you can trigger specific rules, right? So, you know, you can trigger a Lambda function, a uh, step function, all those different things can be done through event bus or event bridge. Uh, and, 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 and these are kind of the, uh, this is a kind of very useful glue that keeps your application together and helps it, well, remove the complexity of it too much. And also there's a bunch of integration when it comes to partners. A lot of, a lot of these things can be triggered and, and read from uh, when it comes to event bridge. We, 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 and this, this list, this keeps on expanding. Okay. Moving to another non-tech topic, so um, let's let's continue the, the process. So uh, let's talk about how to focus on your team, right? So we have we are very proud at Amazon that we kind of we, we talk about our team or what we do is 
you build it, you run it, right? So we have this, you build it, you run it mentality. So you don't just develop code. You do not just provision servers. You do not just install patches. You do day-to-day -day contact with operations, with anything you build. So you build an application, you build its infrastructure, you, you basically, you are in contact with your customers. So, and this is how internal AWS teams work. If a team builds a product, they're kind of responsible for most of the other things, right? The underlying things and working with the customer, helping it expand. So it's not something you just throw at the other side of the court and help it work, right? So, and why is this important? So one of the things I need to mention is team size and communication paths. If you have three people in your team, how many communication paths do you have? Well, three, right? How many communications paths if you have if you have five people? Ten. This is already too much, right? So if you want to calculate your communication paths, you have to do a, a pretty complex uh, uh, um, formula, and you get this exponential growth of communication paths, and that kind of you know that group of five, five starts breaking down into more, more smaller groups, and that's not ideal. So one of the things we have we have built, and uh, well, one of the things we follow at AWS, and, and a lot of people also start following, is the concept of two pizza teams. So what is a two pizza, two pizza team? It's a very vague term, right? So it's, um, it's a team that you can feed with two medium or large pizzas. Now, how big is the pizza? I don't know. How... How, big, how much the people can eat. You know, maybe I can be a pizza team by myself. I can eat two pizzas, I guess, right? Uh, depending on <laughs> where you come from. But, uh, you know, it's a small enough team that you can kind of uh, work together. The communication lines are not too stretched. Uh, everybody there can work together, right? It's very important to keep this little constant team. And they work not on a major thing. They work on a couple of microservices, their own thing, or, or some of their product as well. One more thing I need to mention is separable versus complex tasks. And this is important, right? Um, so if you have a separable task, such as like, uh, I don't know, somebody tells me, hey, can you move that pile of gravel, gra gravel from that place to the other place? You know, as you do in the army, for example. Uh, those are separable tasks. Many people can come and do it and it will be faster. But if you do a complex task that requires, let's say, a more cognitive tools, it requires working together. You have to get more people with their cognitive abilities to work together on a complex task to make it um, better, right? to make it successful. So here, here's an example. Um, what's an ability? What's an ability of a person? So an ability is a collection of cognitive tools. Let's say we have a person called Adam here. And Adam, he knows mobile development. He knows some Java, maybe analytics in Python, complex queries, blah, 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 right? He has a set of cognitive tools, set of skills that bring his ability to number five, right? And if we look at his team, we have Betsy that has you know, a bit less, and we have Carl that has less, right? Carl is kind of the weakest chain here, right? So Carl has three, um, uh, Adam and Betsy have, well, four, five and four, respectively. So if we combine Adam and Betsy, our two best people in the team, into one team, we get a team ability of six, which is great, right? So amazing. But we have overlapping abilities. We have overlapping, overlapping cognitive tools. So a better team is a team that has more cognitive tools. So if we take Carl and, and Betsy, which have different set of skills, the team ability has now just skyrocketed to seven, right? So it's not necessarily to have the, have the best set of people inside of your teams. So, and this is where, where we talk about diversity, right? We, we like to tout, hey, diversity is important. But why is diversity important? Well, a diverse team brings, brings benefits, right? You have teams from different backgrounds, people from different uh, you know, uh, experiences. They bring different set of cognitive tools to their abilities. So if you have a hiring manager that keeps hiring copies of that hiring manager, you're going to get a team with only the set of abilities that hiring manager has. When you hire people, make sure to get people from various backgrounds, experiences, so you can get that number of ability much higher with a more complex set of cognitive abilities coming from diverse backgrounds. So very important to think about that. Um, also, some cognitive abilities might need to be learned in order. Um, another thing, when it comes to small, um, small networks and creativity, this is an example from 
uh, Broadway, right? From the Broadway, um, you know, the, the big musical thing on, on, in New York. So 1945 uh, to 1989, basically they had 2,092 people has worked on Broadway. And um, one of the things they have, they have tried to calculate is um, when are these musicals have, when have these musicals performed the best? Or because it's usually a set of people that has been changing from time to time. And let's say you have a group of people that have just met each other, like never worked together, small connectivity between them. And you have a group of people that have, you know, kind of in the middle of the road and the people who have worked together for years, right? So where do you think the best performance was? Where did they perform the best? When was the uh, creativity the highest? Well, it was in the middle. Right? It was with the people who kind of know each other to an extent, but not too much. So it's not the people who don't know each other, of course, that you know completely new to each other. It kind of takes takes some time for them to to work it together. Um, and even the people who kind of know each other for tens of years, right, a long time, you kind of get too comfortable and you don't keep uh, being as creative as much. But this kind of a sweet spot in the middle helps you be creative. You know, you know each other, but you still try to prove yourself. Uh, so this, this is why rotational people, by bringing in people from other teams and moving your people to different teams, helps them grow and helps your team stay creative, stay on top of it. Uh, super, super important when it comes to these kind of things. All right. Almost my last slide. Uh, do not reinvent the wheel. Do not try to create a thing that already exists. Use services out there. Use things that exist. Uh, do not have, do not try to rebuild your own full serverless architecture because something exists already. If you want to make a recognition engine that will recognize things on images, use a service out there. Do not have to, do not create it, do not create it yourself. Focus on the thing that actually brings your application value, your business logic between your serverless functions or your serverless application. That's the thing that brings you value. You know, running infrastructure, running, you know, hold those other things, that not necessarily brings you value directly, right? Uh, I just want to make a couple of case studies because we need to talk about it, right? Um, our customer, Comic Relief, had, um, during their Comic Relief, it's, a, it's this big thing where people call in, uh, um, call in uh, and, and kind of donate a lot of money. Uh, so they have a lot, a lot of like donations, 350 donations per second in that time, which can get spiky, right? So you want to make sure that your, your, your infrastructure can handle it, but you do not want to overpay because you're charity. So here's an example of what they did with serverless. So back in 20, 2015, uh, their cost to running uh, basically a, a comic relief thing cost $83,000 roughly, right? But back in 2009, when they switched to serverless, it was only $5,000, right? So all together. And how much does a serverless cost? $92. $92. That's ridiculous. I have a friend that that actually runs a fully fledged serverless application for 100,000 plus users, right? His yearly cost is less than $100, which is amazing. Like the monitoring cost or the backup cost is higher than the operating cost. I have a question here for any project. Are there any scenarios where you would benefit more from opposed to serverless or it will be dependent on the type of application? It really depends on the type of application. Again, some applications were really great on serverless, some don't, right? So there are some things that, for example, you might want to do some long-term processing, et cetera, et cetera. It really depends on your use case. But if it can be a serverless application, do it. It helps you grow much faster. So, and, and not everything has to be a serverless application, but if you keep going, there may be a certain subset of features of your application can be serverless. Not the entire product has to be serverless, right? So maybe one core, is still a monolith or sitting on a, on, a, on a virtual machine, but other things can be, you know, pulled from serverless applications. So it's not uh, it's not just black and white. Okay, I'm back to this, and yeah, I guess that's my time. Thank you very much. Uh, please, I will be later on on the Slack channel. Uh, if you have any questions here as well, reach out to me on any of the social media. I also do some streaming on Twitch twice a week now. So if you want to learn some database goodness and, and spend some time with me on, on stream please do join and yeah i thank you very much uh for for the opportunity and i hope to see you again one day in person thank you